Hey everyone, um, so have your note sheets ready. This is going to be an introduction video, more um, of a review of some Algebra 2 topics that we're going to be using as we cover our Limits and Derivatives unit. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Okay, throughout this vocabulary review, I'm just going to be running through and just giving you some reminders. I'm going to actually ask that you recall a lot of this on your own um, or use uh, your peers to do so. So this is really a very brief overview of these vocabulary words. The first thing we're going to do is um, take a look at polynomial vocabulary. And the um, terms I'm going to talk about first are actually describing the polynomial by the number of terms. So if a polynomial has a single term, uh, it is considered a monomial. So it could be 3 or 4x, those are monomials. Binomials have two terms, something like x minus 4 or uh, even like 5x cubed plus 7x. Those are both binomials. Trinomials have three terms, um, so I could do 3x squared minus 2x plus 5, or anything similar, as long as it has three terms. And a polynomial will have, actually all of these are considered polynomials, except some of them are more specific, monomial, binomial, trinomial. All are polynomials, but when we um, get beyond a three-termed polynomial, we just call them generally polynomials. So this is usually used for, so monomials, binomials, trinomials, and all others. Okay. Um, constant, the next, oh sorry, I should move on. The next group describes the polynomial by the degree. So our constant uh, has no variable, like 5. So if I give you y equals 5, that is a constant polynomial. A linear, a linear um, forms a line, but it is a line that has a slope other than 0, whereas this one has a slope of 0. So this could be y equals um, 4x minus 2, or simply y equals negative 3x. It uh, doesn't have to have a y-intercept other than 0. It could be just negative 3x. But that means that it is linear, and it has an exponent of 1 that we normally don't write in there. A quadratic, uh, a quadratic is going to be something f of x equals 2x squared minus 5, or anything with a power of 2. A cubic will have a power of 3. It doesn't have to have as many terms as anything else as long as the largest power is a 3. So you could have a cubic trinomial, you can have a cubic um, polynomial as long as the highest degree is 3. And quartic is a, another word you may or may not remember, but quart being 4, a quartic polynomial will have a degree of 4. Okay. All right, for this um, example here, I'm or for these terms, I'm going to use an example. So if you can write this down, f of x equals 2x cubed minus 16x squared plus 32x. And I'm going to be using this to discuss um, these terms. So the first thing we're going to look at is our lead coefficient. And our lead coefficient is the coefficient of the term with the largest degree. So in this case, my lead coefficient is 2 because the 2 is in front. My constant term is the term that would go at the end here. In this case, it's going to be a 0. So my constant term is 0. Or you could say that it has no constant term, but I'm writing 0 intentionally. The next thing is my x-intercepts. And sometimes I have more than one x-intercept. And we have multiple ways of finding them. We could look at our graphing calculator and see where it crosses the x-axis. We could factor this. And this one actually factors very nicely. Because if I go ahead and factor out a GCF, I'm going to get 2x. And then I will have x squared minus 8x plus 16. I will continue to factor, and I'm going to see that 2x, and then this is really simple, x minus 4 and x minus 4. So in this case, I'm going to have two unique 
x-intercepts. I'm going to have an x-intercept at 0, 0, and that came from where x equals 0. And then I'm going to have one where both of these actually exist, and that is 4, 0, where x equals 4. So those are my two x-intercepts for this graph. My y-intercept comes from when you go ahead and substitute in a 0. In this case, when I substitute in 0, every term becomes 0, and my x-intercept happens to also be a y, or my y-intercept happens to also be an x-intercept. So, but what's key is you have to substitute in the 0. Now, if I were to give you something as simple as this, let's just go x squared minus 4, my intercept happens to be the constant term. It is the case here as well, except it, it was 0. So my y-intercept for this particular new function here would just be 0, comma negative 4, because if I substitute it in a 0, the first piece becomes 0, and I'm left with a negative 4. That is my y-intercept. But we can always use just substitute in 0. The next thing we're going to look at is the shape of this. And the shape of my graph comes from whether or not it's an even or an odd function. And even functions have an even degree, and odd functions have an odd degree. So my even functions include my quadratics, my cortex, and any sixth or eighth or tenth degree polynomials. And the shape of these will always be that both tails, both ends, are headed in the same direction. So this is what a quadratic would look like. I could also have a quadratic that opens down, but notice both of them, both of the tails are opening in the same direction. For a cortic, a cortic is going to have something where we get an extra kind of bump in there, and that because we may end up with extra intercepts. So these are all examples of even and even functions. My the direction as to whether it points up or points down will come back from my lead coefficient. If my lead coefficient is negative, we know it opens down. So if the lead coefficient is negative, we know it's going to open down. And if the lead coefficient is positive, like this one is here, we know that it's going to open up. Now my odd functions are my linear, my cubic, a fifth or, or seventh degree polynomials. And what we have with these is one tail is going to go down and the other tail is going to go up. Now that's true for a line as well, if you think about it. Um, the cubic, it gives us kind of this curve, and we may also see some that look more like this. Well, they also could open in the other direction. Again, that goes back to whether or not we have a positive or a negative coefficient. And if you think about the line, this has a positive slope. My lead coefficient is positive. Well, the same thing is true when we take a look at the cubic graph. When the lead coefficient is positive, it kind of resembles that line in the direction that it's opening. So this one would have a negative lead coefficient because it's doing kind of that negative slope idea. Lastly, we look at our domain and our range. Our domain of even functions, well, our domain of all polynomial functions, even and odd, is always all real numbers. That doesn't matter because there's not a single number we can think of, positive, negative, zero, fractions, decimals, anything, that I couldn't substitute in and raise it to the third power or subtract 16. There's nothing I can't do. So my domain is always all real numbers. My range, on the other hand, for odd functions, it's always all real numbers. But for even functions, we have to determine the range, or the range by looking at the maximum or the minimum value. And that means, like, if I have a minimum down here, okay, if I have a minimum, then I'm looking at everything from that minimum up to positive infinity. If I'm looking at a maximum, like this one, then I'm looking at everything from that value down to negative infinity. So my minimum and maximum will help me determine my range. My domain, always all real numbers. 
Okay, so for evaluating polynomials, I'm going to reintroduce synthetic substitution. You are more than welcome to use regular substitution. I'm just going to provide what I believe to be a faster way to use substitution. So if I want to find where f of x, oh, I want to find f of, let's say, 3, then I'm going to set up my substitution to use 3. I'm going to use the coefficients. Now if I'm missing terms, like I am here missing the x cubed term, I must fill it in with 0 x cubed. That means negative 3, 0, 1, negative 4, and 9. Those came from all of my coefficients, including the subtraction sign. The process goes drop down the first one, and then I'm going to multiply and add and repeat. So I multiply 3 times negative 3 and get negative 9. I will add. Multiply, I get negative 27. Add. Multiply 3 times negative 26. Feel free to grab your calculators and use that throughout there. 3 times negative 26 is negative 78. Add negative 82. I should move that over here, huh? three times negative 82 and I get negative 246 add positive 9 and I get negative 237 this leftover value in the end is what happens when I have f of 3 I get negative 237 if you went ahead and used straight substitution where you wrote it out as negative 3 put in a 3 raise it to the fourth plus 3 squared minus 4 times 3 plus 9, you will still get negative 237. So let's try one more. Let's try f of negative 1. So I'm going to use negative 1. I'm going to use the same numbers that I used across the top here. Negative 3, 0, 1, negative 4, and positive 9. Negative 3. Remember my rules are to multiply the outsides, add, and then repeat. Negative 1 times negative 3 is positive 3. Bring it down by adding. Negative 1 times 3 is negative 3. Add. Positive 2, negative 2. Positive 2, 11. So if you were to substitute in negative 1, you should come up with 11. All right a new type of function. This is called a rational function. It's a rational function because I, ha I will, um, I have, it's a function made of a polynomial enumerator and a polynomial denominator. What we get here is we're going to end up with graphs that are in, that look like they're kind of in pieces. We get branches. This is where we have asymptotes. So to find our x-intercepts, the idea is when is the numerator become a zero? The numerator becomes a zero when we substitute or when we make the numerator equal zero. So 3x plus 6 equals zero and you'll get x equals negative 2. So my in x-intercept is at negative 2 comma 0. So write that down. The numerator equals 0 for your x-intercepts. For your y-intercept, you have to substitute in x equals 0 everywhere. So if I substitute in 0 into the numerator, I get 6. If I substitute 0 in the denominator, I get negative 20. I want to reduce that by 2, so I get negative 3 tenths. So I have 0, comma, negative 3 tenths as my y-intercept. Again, that comes from substituting in 0 everywhere for your y-intercept. Okay, my vertical asymptotes come from setting the denominator equal to 0. So if I set my denominator equal to 0, I probably want to factor. I'm going to start by factoring out a 5. So I get x squared minus 3x minus 4. Then I can go ahead and factor the denominator a little bit more. And I come up with two places for vertical asymptotes. My vertical asymptotes are at x equals 4 and at x equals negative 1. When we graph these, we actually graph 
um, vertical lines going through x equals 4 and at x equals negative 1. My horizontal asymptotes. This is kind of a big deal that we're actually going to delay talking about, um, but it does affect um, my horizontal asymptotes do affect my range. So these two things are very much connected. Uh, in this particular case, my horizontal asymptote is it going to be at y equals 0, but this is going to come up in a few days, so I'm going to hold off on talking about my horizontal asymptotes. My domain. My domain comes up whenever I have um, an issue with an x value. Well, my issues are actually going to be found with my uh, denominator, so I'm using my vertical asymptotes. So I would say that my domain is all real numbers, but x cannot equal 4 or negative 1. Another way to say that is actually to use interval notation, which says I'm talking about negative infinity to negative 1, union with negative 1 to positive 4, union with positive 4 to, pos to positive infinity. These breaks right here at negative 1 and at positive 4 say you can go really close to negative 1, but you can't actually equal negative 1. You can go really close to positive 4, but you can't actually equal positive 4. So this is a notation that we are, gonna, we are going to be using. Yes, we will be using that. Um, but we'll work through that together. All right, and the last type of function we're going to talk about are piecewise functions. And this is something that I think we should talk more about in Algebra 2. But um, let's go ahead and go through this. A piecewise function is a function that involves pieces of multiple functions. In this case, two different functions. The function x, x minus 3 and the function of negative 2x plus 1, both of which are lines. So it's kind of important to know what shape is happening. Well, what we're going to be looking at is we want to talk about the function x minus 3 only when x is greater than 4. And we're going to talk about the function negative 2x plus 1 only when x is less than or equal to 4. So to do this, we're going to go ahead and make two tables of values. Okay, and I've got the two parts of them there. And I'm going to substitute in values that make sense. So for this one, even though it does, it says not to use uh, equal to 4, I have to use 4 in order to figure out where it starts. So this one is not going to actually be graphed as a solid line or a solid dot. I'll explain more when we get to the graphing part. But go ahead and substitute in 4. So I'm going to get 1. And then I want numbers that are greater than 4. So 5, 6, 7. That should give us enough to get started. So if I put in 5, I get a 2. 6, I get a 3. 7, I get a 4. So as I go to my graph, I'm going to start at x equals 4 and y equals 1. 1, 2, 3, 4. But I'm going to put an open circle. So I still want to use this, but I want to make it an open circle. And then I'm going to graph the rest of this. And I get this line. So this is when x is greater than 4. So now I go to the other side and I say, well, what happens when x is less than or equal to 4? And so now I want to choose numbers that are less than 4 because that's what this piece says. And these are some good values. I can go to 0. I can go beyond that. So if I start at positive 4 and I substitute it in, I get negative 8 plus 1 or negative 7. If I go to 3, I get negative 6 plus 1 is negative 5. 2, I put in that and I get negative 4 plus 1 or negative 3, negative 1, and positive 1. So let's go ahead and start to graph this one. So I'm going to go to 4 comma negative 7. Oops, I didn't include all of those on there, so I'm going to put a solid dot right here. Now notice one of these has to be open and the other one has to be closed, or otherwise it wouldn't be a function because it would fail the vertical line test. The next one I'm going to use is negative 3, negative 5, one, or positive 3, negative 5. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then I'm getting this pattern. And this is the line I graph. So this is a picture of my piecewise function. It's a piece of two different functions. Let's try one more together. 
Okay, this piecewise function has two different pieces, x squared minus 4 when x is greater than 2, and x plus 1 when x is less than or equal to 2. For this one, I'm going to have a parabola on this side and a line on this side. Now, I think it's good to make at least a mental note of what it's going to be so you know that you're actually fulfilling those shapes because you want to make sure you pick enough points that you actually represent what that picture should look like because if you just do a couple pieces of a parabola it may look something like something other than a parabola so it's good to make sure you get enough of the shape to distinguish it between uh, another type of function. So once again, I'm going to make my two charts. This one's my x and my x squared minus 4, and then x and x plus 1. Okay, um, I'm going to choose 2, but I'm going to be very careful with this one because I don't want to be equal to 2. That's going to be open. And then I'm going to choose numbers greater, so 3, 4, and let's say 5. And on this one, I'm going to choose 2 as well, but I'm going to choose numbers less than 2, so 1, 0, and negative 1. And this one right here is going to be solid. So I'm going to substitute in 2 and I get 0, substitute in 3 and I get 5, substitute in 4, I get 16 minus 4 is 12, I'm definitely going to run out of space. So we're going to leave it alone at that because I'm already off of my graph. All right, um, so if I substitute in positive 2, I get 0, and that's going to be an open circle. And then at positive 3, I'm at 5, so I'm already up here. And I know this is going to have a parabolic shape, so it's not a line. Whoops, it's kind of a, a nice enough picture. Now for the other side, if I substitute in 2, I get 3. Put in 1, I get 2, 0, 1, and then 0. And this should show a line on the other side. So at 2, I'm at positive 3. That's a solid circle. And then I'll see this go down like this. And there we have this one. So completely different types of shapes that we were given here. All right. So now you've got um, a worksheet in your packet there that I'd like you to complete. There are six problems. There are two polynomials, two rationals, and two piecewise. And I will have the answer key available for you to check.